Welcome to Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. Tonight we're going to have a two or three segment program in which we explore the way artists feel about themselves and how they express it in their painting. And in so doing, how they express what we are, what the society is that we are living in now, what we are like, who form that society and the environment in which we live. And we'll talk about the entire 20th century in a very brief manner. In the first segment, we're going to have a discussion of the psychological impact on their paintings of the inner struggles for fulfillment of Vincent van Gogh and Paul Cezanne. Starting with the first picture, we look at a self-portrait by Van Gogh with bandaged ear, following the episode with Paul Gauguin's visit ending in tragedy and Van Gogh severing his own ear. Uh, in this portrait, we see something of the fevered quality of Van Gogh's existence. We see his eyes not as intent and burning as they will be in before and after this. He's drained from the violence of the encounter, the uh, severity of the wound, and the psychic trauma of it. But we see Van Gogh expressing deeply his own feelings and emotions. And this is why his paintings are so revealing, because he puts himself so directly into them. In the next picture, a self-portrait by Paul Cezanne, uh, both painted about the same age, uh, Van Gogh 36, Cezanne 38. Of course, Van Gogh will die in one year after the painting we just saw, while Cezanne has half his life yet to go. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Cezanne has a portion of his anatomy wrapped in a bandage, though I suspect it's something as uh, less earth-shaking, uh, much less earth-shaking than Van Gogh's wound. He's, perhaps he's trying a cure for baldness or something of the sort. He, did lose his hair as he went on in life. But there's something in his eyes, a certain uh, vacant inwardness and introspection that su suggests for those who will look closely at his work that his paintings do reveal his inner personality. In the next painting, an early painting by Vincent van Gogh, we see a peasant woman painted during his Borinage period in Belgium when he first goes to become a missionary, then decides to be a painter. And look at the expression of the woman. Look how he searches out her hopelessness, perhaps, her desperation, her suffering. And I would say not only was the woman suffering from her poor circumstances, her primitive circumstances, but this is Vincent van Gogh's suffering. Now look similarly in an early portrait by Paul Cezanne of the very faithful Impressionist collector, Victor Choquet, who was a minor government official but spent what money he had collecting a masterful collection of Van Gogh's, Cezanne's, Manet's, the, the whole Impressionist group. Look again at the expression on the face of Choquet and see the sadness in the eyes, the sensitivity in the face. I would say this is not only Choquet's sensitivity, but it's Paul Cezanne's. Going to an early painting by Cezanne, an early landscape, uh, somewhat earlier than the Choquet portrait, uh, perhaps prefacing this by saying that early in his career, Cezanne is obsessed with violence, hostility, sexual repression, sexual frustration, and he paints such, pic such pictures as the murder, the rape, uh, the temptations of St. Anthony, that kind of thing. Moving slightly beyond that period, though still a young man, about 30, he paints this picture called the railroad cutting. And it's my supposition and interpretation that we are seeing the emerging personality of Cezanne coming from the dark past of turmoil and violence that was so much a part of him in his early life. And I would suggest that that small cubicle white building in front of the dark railroad cut is symbolically the new self of Cezanne emerging, as if watched on the upper left by an astounded house. It looks like it has two eyes, an open little mouth, and a solid mountain peak in the far right. Perhaps that's an early appearance of Mount Saint Victoire, Mount Saint Victor, which will loom so large in his work. One could al almost say that that's his mother on the left, concerned about poor Paul developing, and on the right is the massiveness of the father. I mean, maybe that's carrying a little far, but let's follow through in the next two or three pictures by 
Cezanne, this developing sense of personal self in a white object or a central object. Now let's go to Van Gogh later in his career to see a sense of a small object with which Van Gogh identifies, and I would say that it would be the dark figure crossing the drawbridge. Uh, and of course, a bridge is very symbolic. It gets us from here to there, from earthly life to spiritual life, from uh, the materiality of our early existence to a, an enhanced appreciation of the world when, when we are reborn, perhaps, in our second life uh, on earth. If, as Christ speaks of, we must be reborn, in a sense. Keep in mind the cypresses at the left-hand side of the picture. That is the goal toward which Van Gogh is going in this picture. He will identify himself with cypresses, and we'll see two more as the pictures continue. Now, let's go back to Cezanne in this uh, still life with a commode. And let's keep in mind the light-dark antithesis again, the light of the foreground objects with the exception of the uh, black vase to the left. That, I would suggest, is the new self of Cezanne emerging, uh, developing from the dark background of this uh, past of turmoil, despair, and suffering. Let's go to the next Cezanne and we see how the white foreground figure has loomed into dominance in the, in, the, in the picture. Majestic in a sense, everything else becomes secondary to this plaster cupid. And I would suggest, it's my feeling anyway, that Cezanne is identifying with this plaster cupid. He's saying, this is me uh, unconsciously. I, I'm sure he didn't sit down. Okay, I'm going to paint a picture that will tell everybody about my psychological state. I'm going to identify with this plaster cupid. He just had the uh, inner instinct, the feeling to paint it. Now, as we go along, let's look at this picture by Van Gogh uh, called The Orchard, which he painted early on his arrival in Arles in southern France after leaving Paris in a fit of despair and despondency. The Paris visit had uh, been positive in the sense that he had encountered the Impressionist painters for the first time. He had reestablished his relationship with his brother, Theo. Uh, who would later, would continue from that point on to support him financially. Uh, but the hecticness of the city and the artist's life there had grown too much and he fled to a quieter environment in the South. Uh, he writes in his letters his exultation at the spring and, and one would look at the picture and say, well, uh, he is exulting. The dominant element in the picture is this light spring blossomed uh, pear or almond tree. He speaks of both trees luxuriantly in blossom. Uh, but I would say that Van Gogh has dragged a little bit of his rickety past with him, his troubled past, where he couldn't get a job. He struggled to be a missionary and failed at that. He had trouble with the opposite sex, uh, establishing any lasting relationships. And uh, he, Van Gogh spoke of his early frozen beginning in life, uh, where his emotions were stunted. And look at the left-hand side of the picture and see that dark leafless tree intruding very strangely in this otherwise uh, bursting with life springtime picture. And I would suggest that we're seeing the two sides of Van Gogh combined in that single picture with hope dominant but the past uh, dragging its weary present, uh, ever present uh, in his life. Here we see Van Gogh identifying with these cypresses. Look how they've grown to, in majesty to fill the picture with power and a, rising, a writhing tumult, uh, how they were so tiny in the picture with the drawbridge. <clears throat> it's 1889, Van Gogh is reaching the crisis of, of his life. Uh, he has one more year to live, and this is one last uh, outcry of his tortured soul, in a sense, as the cypresses writhe and twist up out of the picture as if Van Gogh wants to rise beyond the uh, limitations and suffering of his present environment. Look at the central object. See how, how we're forced to focus on it as Van Gogh forced himself to focus on it or was forced to focus on it by the intensity of his psychological needs. Keep in mind the central image, the white plaster cupid, the little white house in Cezanne's work. 
And uh, we go to Starry Night by Van Gogh somewhat later, a month or two or six months later than Cypress's. Van Gogh's late masterpiece where the cypress rises to the tumult of the heavens. Van Gogh writes in a letter to his brother that perhaps we find peace uh, after death in the starry spheres and orbs of heaven. And Van Gogh is reaching for heaven, literally, through the media of this tree. And we look at that central swirling force, a symbol of the opposites of life, in a sense, that come together in this powerful union, as if Van Gogh himself has somehow unified his personality, integrated it with great effort and great suffering in this final masterpiece. So that the cypress and that central swirling form are the key elements in this picture. Look what Cezanne does with the painting of Mount Saint-Victoire, how the central image of that mountain dominates the picture. And it's my feeling that just as that little railroad cutting was Cezanne as as the plaster cupid was Cezanne, <clears throat> so this mountain is Cezanne. Cezanne identifies with it its solidity, its permanence, as a refuge for him, as a substitute for his early uh, lack of equilibrium, his early shakiness in a sense, so he goes the opposite way toward this eternal solidity. Here it is in the distance, as if he's still working toward it, moving toward it, uh, it's embraced, caressed almost by the feathery touch, touches of the limbs of the pine that frame it and protect it in a sense, preserving it for Cezanne's approach. Here in the final picture of this segment on Van Gogh and Cezanne, we see Mount Saint-Victoire naked and looming uh, with the, the strokes separated and faceted, uh, which, will, which is Cezanne's late style and which will influence Picasso and the Cubists. Uh, Cezanne has arrived, in a sense, at self-realization. He has climbed <clears throat> the summit of the peak as Van Gogh climbed the summit of the peak in terms of his own personal development. Uh, Van Gogh's life ends tragically early at 37 with suicide. Cezanne's is a continuing struggle, alternately one of balance and stability and great emotional power that ends at the age of 65 when he's out painting and caught in a rainstorm. So that in the late 19th century, we see the 20th century set by these two men of great creative power and introspection. This concludes the first segment of the program. We'll be right back with the second. Thank you. Hi. In this section, we're going to build upon the uh, work of Van Gogh, and we're going to talk about the struggle of people in the 20th century, artists and just plain folks, just you and I, with the 20th century, the increased technology of it, the increased pace of it that has uh, really almost eliminated the past values and traditions, uh, societal or spiritual that sustained us in the past. And really, during the whole 20th century, we have been striving to evolve a new set of values, a new understanding of what it is to be human, alive, and functioning as the 20th century nears its close. The 20th century has been a period of great struggle. And looking at the first picture, I I selected a painting by Thomas Cole called The Expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, a Hudson River painter of the 19th century. And I did it because I feel that, in a sense, 20th century mankind has been expelled from a Garden of Eden, that we've been uh, lost, that we've been lost, uh, separated, as I suggested, from the firmness of our past traditions, our roots, that for mankind to grow, we must keep our traditions, dropping those that are gradually grow worthless and evolving new ones as we go along, but we can't sever the roots of the tree or the whole structure may topple and die. And uh, it's my feeling that the arts of the 20th century reveal a great suffering 
in humanity that we cut too much of our traditions, too much was simply blown away by the force of the 20th century, the wars and, and developments and so on. And in this picture of Thomas Cole, two tiny figures in the desolation of the left-hand side of the picture. Uh, doesn't that perhaps left-hand side echo the desolation of 20th century existence? And for a close-up view of the couple, we could turn back to the 15th century Italian Masaccio and the expulsion from paradise. And look at the suffering of Adam and Eve, us, in a sense, expelled from heaven. Uh, expelled from contact with our living heritage, our humanity, in a sense, in the 20th century. And this is a masterpiece of simple form and a very touching picture of human suffering. And I, I'm afraid that's the state we're in today. In this painting by Francisco Goya in the early 19th century, the great Spanish painter, look at this ritual of madness as the citizens engage in what is nominally a carnival scene, but look at that hideous <clears throat> grinning, all dominating face above the crowd, and isn't that big brother? Isn't 1984, hasn't it arrived in 1805, 12, whenever the picture was painted? Look at the individual figures. Look at the two light women in the foreground who dance like automatons, like marionettes. And haven't we become automatons in many respects in the 20th century? We'll look at some paintings by some artists uh, who say that. <clears throat> Uh, I'm not saying we're all automatons or we're all automatons all the time, but we have to continually re resist the pressure. Look at the dark figure in, with the horns behind the woman on the left and how devilishly devilish she seems and all the red faces in the picture that seem so lurid and destructive in a sense. Is this the world that Michelangelo visualized that, or perhaps uh, God uh, visualized in his original uh, creation in this great monument of the history of human expression. God on the right reaches over to touch Adam's finger and the spark of life passes to him and all the subsequent generations of man. You know that God's outstretched finger, Adam's limp finger, igniting a spark. Hasn't the spark perhaps dulled in our own time? Look at Michelangelo's conception of mankind, this nearly godlike <clears throat> perfect, beautifully structured creature, and keep in mind what the 20th century view of mankind is. Here's Willem de Kooning's portrait of Mark Rosenberg in 1957. Now, I, I've never met Mark Rosenberg, but uh, I would have to be introduced to him several times to recognize him from this picture. Uh, he's been totally dehumanized, depersonalized, turned into the fashionable, fashionable abstract expressionist slash. I'm not saying this isn't an effective picture in the abstract expressionist mode. It is. But a human being? No, it is not. In Alberto Giacometti's three figures and a head in a square, look how withered and shrunken humanity is in Giacometti's vision in the 20th century. Mere remnants of what we once were, barely surviving perhaps. Look at uh, Giorgio de Chirico, the early uh, 20th century fantasist surrealist. This is called the painter's family. So look at their heads, their bodies. Look at the little child born, held by the tender mother. Mannequins giving birth to mannequins. Create uh, bodies that are part uh, geometric structures. These artists are saying something about the dehumanization of mankind, the loss of our humanity, the mechanization of our humanity, the destruction of our humanity, our sensibilities in the 20th century. Oscar Kokoschka's picture called The Tempest or the Bride of the Wind, painted in 1914, the year the World War I begins, perhaps expresses Kokoschka's feeling of what life is, has, is, and has been in the 20th century. A tempest, a storm, where Kokoschka on the left holds his mistress who seems sleeping without any awareness of the torment and torrents of storm that nearly seem to sweep the flesh off Kakashka. It's as if his body is rotting and rippling in a sense. Kakashka, as an expressionist, vents his emotions and tells the world through his painting and his style what his work, what the world is like. Other artists, such as Fernand Leger, say what the world is like in just the opposite way. 
They express the mechanization of it, the technology of it. Here is Soldier with a pipe, the Tin Man. He's become a robot in a sense. And as he huffs and puffs on his pipe and those round bowling balls come pouring out of the uh, bowl of the pipe, look how his face turns red, expressing his strain, his suffering perhaps under the inhumanity of modern existence, the struggle of modern existence, the struggle to remain human in modern existence, or fighting the uh, mechanization that has nearly overwhelmed him. Keep in mind the red in his face, and look at where red plays a prominent part in this self-portrait by Edvard Munch, the Norwegian painter and very influential expressionist painter at the t turn of the 20th century. Look how the red echoes the anxiety, the hostility, the despair of his own being. Say. Look how a head, how shadow supplants the red in this portrait, self-portrait by Rembrandt, painted when he was about 20 years old. And how the head, the eyes in shadow suggest emotional problems or Rembrandt is, is groping for the light, groping for understanding, for enlightenment in a sense. Now, the point I would like to make here is that there is a key difference here. That Rembrandt is going through a normal development of youth and growing to uh, adulthood, middle age, and old age, and that in subsequent pictures by Rembrandt we'll see a normal evolution. It's my position that too many 20th century artists start out with a sense of despair and hopelessness, and they simply develop it further as they go along, uh, not leaving adolescent melancholia to develop into full human beings and then experiencing the slings and arrows of life, the tragedies and the joys of, of life and evolving richly from there. Modern artists and perhaps modern people start out with a in deep inbred despair and pessimism. Compare this self-portrait of Rembrandt with the next one a couple of years later when he's 22 or 23, upright, strong, there's still a shadow on the side of the face, but he's ready to go out and challenge life. In the next picture, look how a successful young artist in his 30s, he celebrates his joy in life with Saskia, his wife on his lap. He holds the uh, glass of wine saying, I've made it, joy, life is great. In midlife, he sits like a king on his throne deeper, richer in his understanding of the mysteries of human life, and one feels almost the mysteries of the universe here. There's great understanding, dignity, and presence in the man. This isn't to say that he goes through life without suffering. This picture painted about the same time, a detail. Look at the suffering in the eyes, the sensitive parting of the lips. But he has evolved as life perhaps was meant to be evolved, that the older we get, the more we see joy and suffering. And in what is perhaps his final self-portrait at the age of, what, 63 or so in 1669, his laughing self-portrait, we can ask ourselves, is he laughing more or is it more weeping? Say, over the passage of life, the loss of his children, the loss of his career, the loss of his wife, and so forth. Say, but this is a man who reacted fully to life rather than continuing this nervous anxiety through life that Munch here in a painting called Puberty Expresses. Puberty is a natural time of pain and suffering and when the shadow looms darkly behind the poor, behind the uh, young girl. But in this picture called The Scream, this is all life. Life is, is hopeless, is impossible to live is impossible to survive in. It's just a hell of which rise and the sky turns into flames. So we'll end this segment here on this picture and be back very quickly with our third and final segment. In an excellent exhibition uh, by a contemporary artist at the Allen Stone Gallery, Philip Sherrod shows uh, paintings uh, raging with life is the only way I can describe it. Uh, powerful, rich color, uh, expressive, thick paint, and very, very strong emotional expression that ranges from ecstasy to um, hostility, in a sense. It's his reaction to contemporary life, and, and frankly, I feel that he's one of the artists who can offer a solution to the 
dehumanization of modern life. Interestingly, in the exhibition, which has still lives and landscapes, there are a series of pictures which uh, express the development and birth of his child. In the first picture, called Ode to Fertility, painted in 1976, his wife sits upon his lap um, like a love goddess while symbols of fertility, the oranges, and pet milk circulate around them. In the next picture, uh, in, in 77, she's pregnant, <laughs> as might be expected as a logical offshoot of fertility, and Elena with 16 and a half uh, cityscapes, uh, uh, large pictures, and her belly full of the child soon to be born. Look at the magnificent solidity of forms, the thick, descriptive pink. In 1970, uh, later in 1977, the child is born, little Arantino, uh, called Elena Arantino, King Queen. And I presume she's the queen and he's the new king. Look at that magnificent breast, a symbol of fertility and life, and the peacefulness of the mother, in a sense, and the squirmy intensity of the child. Isn't there something in the composition rem reminiscent of Raphael's Madonna's uh, certainly more hectically conceived with thicker paint and so forth, but certainly in that tradition. Sherrod, a father at a rather late age, asks himself, what will become of my child? And he holds this little baby uh, seemingly covered with targets or bullseyes and he, as he is, and the baby limply hangs as if it's already been wounded in the battle of life. The child grows older and sits with the wife amidst the city, the turbulence and turmoil of Times Square that Sherrod loves so much because it has energy despite its decadence. However, in a later symbolic work, Sherrod shows Aretino at the top left in more or less an allegory where he spouts out the windows and storefronts of the porno district of 42nd Street. Elena is in the foreground. Sherrod is small in red at the bottom center. They're all surrounded by death's head heads and Sherrod asks the question, what will happen to my beloved innocent son in this world of decadence? And the title is Progression on Broadway. They're all topless. You're all topless. 92 inches long, meaning they have no spiritual substance, no minds. They are embroiled in decadence. And in this aspect, Sherrod uh, hates what the world will do to his son. But Sherrod is responding to the world and as the summation of this three-part program, I would say that in artists such as Sherrod, getting back to life, uh, not painting it uh, in a pretty, pretty Pollyanna way, but painting it with courage and guts and power, we will reestablish the vision of life that perhaps Michelangelo had in the Sistine Chapel painting of the creation of Adam. Thanks very much. Program's been Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. Bye-bye.